Sure. Nicole Bailey. Nicole, good morning to you. Good morning. And Marty Steiner Unger, who, if that last name is familiar, would be married to uh, John Unger. Marty, yes. good morning to you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you. Great to have you both with us. So let's talk about GRACE. And uh, we, the acronym stands for Greater Recovery and then finish that and community empowerment and community empowerment okay and so I, that implies you deal in recovery services in the in the community we do uh, we do work in recovery yes um uh our, it's grace is a 501c nonprofit. uh we were actually uh created and born out of the floods of 2016 that happened in southern west virginia just referenced that earlier in the first hour and um and and basically uh our, our organization formed because uh, John Unger, uh, Bill Saviors, and I, we were, we were all doing flood relief in Clay County, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what came out of that were these long-term recovery committees. And basically what they did is they looked at community, uh, community uh, asset, base asset, and saying to the community, what are the resources we have uh, to deal with this natural disaster? And, um, and, once these committees were set up, there were eight of them set up in Southern West Virginia, and the communities themselves were able to navigate uh, the issues, the resources that were needed. Um, you know, the, uh, the three of us, we didn't live in that area, and we, we went home. And John actually called Bill Saviors, and he said, what would you think about starting a nonprofit where we looked at community-based asset uh, development? And, and um, in response, because what is the difference between people coming out of a flood and people um, uh, recovering from addiction there are resources they're all going to need um, and how do they find those and so uh, our nonprofit was born they asked me to, to take part in that uh, our nonprofit was born and um, we kind of sat on the nonprofit for a year and what we we were invited to uh, take a recovery coach class um, by uh, Dave Didden uh, from Jefferson County he invited us and in, uh, even though we're not in recovery ourselves from substance use disorder and basically what we uh, developed was um, a uh, the nonprofit is based on we have two parts we have the education of recovery and life coaches because basically we look at our curriculum as a life coach curriculum with the specialty in addiction um, and also the other half is volunteerism so once people are trained they're invited to become volunteers volunteer coaches and um, right uh, currently, I just looked it up. We have we have 2,400 volunteers uh, here in West Virginia, and we've also trained folks in 14 other states. So um, that's impressive. With I think I think it was like 77,000 hours logged. Mm -hmm. um, and because really, you know, we 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 believe that you know volunteer like we need the professional services as well. We need pathways. We need resources for recovery. Um, and coaches just walk with someone uh, from who they are today, where they are, uh, to the person that they are called to be, they want to become. And so really it's anyone who's looking to improve their lives. And, so. and Nicole, what is your role? I am a facilitator and I'm also a recovery coach professional as well as a restorative justice coach, which is one of the specialties that I receive training in. So I'm also able to work with uh, the Northwestern District Drug Court in North in West Virginia. So take me through one of your days uh, and what you uh, do, how you get involved in the aspects of recovery. Well, I actually went to a different training. I was at a different training and I met John and Marty and they started telling me about this awesome, amazing nonprofit that they have. And I was really curious. And so um, through a scholarship, I was able to take both courses because we do have the um, first class which is the recovery coach and life coaching class and then we have an advanced class so I was able to take both classes and after taking those classes I was a coach and I, I do want to say that when you're coaching someone you're not just helping someone else you're also getting something out of it and I think that's a, a very important part of what we do is a lot of people think oh, I'm gonna become a coach I'm gonna help somebody out and then you, you little by little, you begin to see your own growth. You begin to see how you interact with your own relationships differently. You begin to see uh, the areas that maybe you need to recover in because although our specialty is in recovery, um, we're all in recovery from something, mm -hmm. right? And so um, 
So a typical day for me as a facilitator, um, because I was afforded the opportunity to become a facilitator, um, facilitating the material is very interactive. It's uh, very conversational. It's um, more about how can we just walk with someone and the tools that we gain and help them to utilize those same tools. We learn to listen, right? And so um, when I'm facilitating, we're teaching people how to become better listeners, right? Which is a key part of communication. We think it's all talking, but a key part of communication is listening. A key part of communication is asking questions that um, allow the coachee to really start thinking about their own life. Uh, we talk about goal setting. What are your goals? How do we, how can you achieve your goals? Because ultimately, I'm, as Marty said, we are this, just there to walk with someone. So as a facilitator, I'm just facilitating the material and helping people to understand what we do as coaches and providing the tools for them. As a coach, um, in a session, after you've gone a little while with a coachee, it really is just the coachee. Um, you're having conversation. I always say in a coaching session, I should not be talking that much. I should be talking like 5% of the time, right? Hello, how are you? And then after you've established that relationship, the coachee is excited about telling you what they've been able to accomplish. You know, hey, I worked on this goal, I did this, and we're just asking questions. What were the barriers that you had? Did you have any barriers? Uh, was there anything you would have changed differently about your process? So it's, I would, I would say that coaching is probably one of the most rewarding things that I've ever become involved with. And how does a person find their way to Grace and get a coach assigned? Uh, uh, they can go to our website. It's www.strength, as in muscles, strengthningrace.com. Uh, and on the website, you can, uh, you can find information on how to sign up. Uh, we, we, we are, um, we're partnered with three different colleges. You get college credit with our classes. Um, and you can find out how to sign up to become a coach. And then you can also request a free coach. Now, if I need your coaching services, I need to get through recovery, do the, does the court assign me to you or do I just call you out of um, yeah, curiosity? You, there's actually a form online. You're just going to fill it out, totally confidential, and we will. our goal is to assign you a volunteer coach within 24 hours. Does the court ever assign me to you? Um, so when, when we work with the federal drug courts, we work with all of the federal, federal drug courts in West Virginia, um, they've asked us, uh, our recovery coach professionals, uh, each, each person that's in those drug courts has a volunteer uh, recovery coach professional. Uh, that's so far the only way you would be uh, assigned. But like, you know, we, we've, we've had thousands of people coached. Mostly it's through word of mouth or they get on our website and just request one. Bill? Uh, yeah, uh, I do not know a lot about your program. Uh, as you discuss it, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm a little confused. Uh, we have a massive drug problem in this area, but we also have various facilities that address the drug problem. We have the rehab center, the county has been involved, uh, uh, Grace, uh, several others. Is there a core element that unites, or co not unites, but coordinates all these groups? So, so great, so our coaches, basically we are conduits to resources. Ultimately, we're going to empower that coach through motivational interviewing, as Nicole said, uh, to figure out what is the resource that's going to work for them. So we're going to walk with them as they discern that, and then we connect them to those resources. So, so you, you're basically the first of a, of a chain of events, or a chain of, of organizations that will benefit. So you're the first one. Is that right? We could be. Okay. Not necessarily. Um, what, you know. what would be some of the other first first ones well like for example peer recovery support specialist okay. it's a, it's kind of a similar but it is a different role uh you know also you know people if they're you know if they're in a 12-step program they might have a sponsor or a counselor it's really about getting healthy connections uh to people who are looking for that change for recovery and uh so somebody could have a coach and a prss and a counselor and they could have a sponsor, depending on what pathway they're choosing. But it's about uh, connecting them to those healthy relationships and letting them discern what is the path. What do you think? Pa what is the pathway you think is going to work for you? And getting them connected to it and and, and uh, supporting them as they. Okay, this through. comes back to the question Rob asked a second ago. Uh, some <clears throat> someone that needs help uh, that they're in a confused state of the in their life. Uh, how would they 
how would they find out about you folks? You would not go through the, the Internet and just look for various things. How, would they, how are people directed to you? Well, besides the Internet, traditionally, it's, uh, I, I think it's mostly probably even been word of mouth. Okay. So, you know, are you interested in a coach? You know, I know, this, I, you know, I know where you can get a, a free yeah. coach to walk with you. Okay. Yeah. So, but also, you know, we're here today, and you're helping Certainly. spread the word. And, Certainly, And yes. we really appreciate because we are, uh, to a degree, unknown. Like, we're known in many circles now because we've trained a lot of folks. Um, uh, another, we also have trained different groups of folks. Like, for example, we have... Oh. Can I interrupt you? When you say we've trained folks, are you referring to coaches or are you referring to people going through recovery? So we, well, it's it's both. Uh, you know, a recovery coach doesn't have to be in recovery themselves, but I would say probably about 50% of the folks that we've trained are in recovery themselves. Does it help? Yes. When you're I mean, coaching someone else, have you been through it? Uh, well, you know, a coach themselves, it's a little bit different than PRSS. Like, we don't give advice. So we're really just walking with them and asking those motivational interview questions. And so, uh, you know, I've coached many people in recovery and they've become successful in the recovery. But the reality of it is, is the folks that we're coaching, they own their own recovery. They have to be the person that's ready for change. They have to make the change. And we're really just there as supports to help them figure out what those resources are they need. Is, is it the primary mission of Grace, though, to to educate the education of recovery and life coaches so your primary mission is training people to go out and help people the primary mission is not to be the ones who are helping people we're both it's okay. to train and then connect and it's really uh it really came you know we we started here in the eastern panhandle uh and we started with a little office in jefferson county community ministries they just said hey since you're trained We'll, we'll give you some office space. And, and that's really where we started. And so people would just come, up, come off the streets or they'd be referred to us. Um, but we, what we found is that the need is not just in Jefferson or Berkeley County. Mm -hmm. The need is statewide. So we really, we've gone and we've trained in physical, all kinds of different places in West Virginia, all over West Virginia. And, and this involves now. recovery coaches and life coaches. Yes. What life coaching is done that's not, through you guys, that's not, associated with some form of recovery so one of our one of a, a good example one of our programs we have is nurse health coaches so the, the the rn board has partnered with us and what they they're doing is they're offering um re, our first class recovery coach life coach one to registered nurses and the idea is is that um once they take the class they're invited to become a nurse health coach so if there's any nurse in the state that's even just having a bad day or needs someone to talk to uh, they can reach out and contact one of our nurse health coaches and so it's an rn walking with another rn and what are the elements of the training when someone comes in that's not a coach and then they come out and they're a coach what has happened in between so a, a lot has <laughs> happened in between i mean basically it's a three-hour college class in a period of four days it's really condensed um but they learn a lot about you know um uh, spectrum of attitudes treating people as resources uh, motivational interviewing, active listening, goal setting, you know, sense of purpose. It really is giving them the skills. So when somebody says, I'm ready for change, I'm ready, they're going to walk with them and they know what questions to ask them and how to help them discern uh, different choices and, and where to find those resources they need to become the person they're called to be. Do you have facilities that you that you operate yourself or do you work in partnership with say recovery center and some of the others well we work in partnership with a lot of groups yeah. um we don't have we're really just uh our resource center is a resource center without walls so we're really uh you know we do a lot of things now we used to do everything in person but since covid we do everything virtually and i will say the one positive thing about that is that we've been able to reach a lot of people like we've had people request coaches from south africa Mm. which I don't even know how they got that information. But mm -hmm. um, we really, um, we, we try to, we try, if an organization says, hey, we'd like to work with you, um, we're just like, let us know, like, how, what does that look like and how can we provide coaches for you? you so f you've been existing about eight years, I, I believe. Well, really since 2018. Okay, uh, uh, five years. Uh, you say you, uh, you've worked with many people. And I realize there's a spectrum of what you mean by when you work with. Yes. Uh, what's the approximate number of people that you've had an impact on? 
I can't answer that. I know we've trained over 4,000 coaches. That's the numbers. Okay, yeah. Uh, so we've trained over 4,000 coaches. And as when I'm facilitating the classes I ended, I always say, you know, our goal, our hope is that you get to actually coach one person in your life at some point. Sure. But we know coaches have trained. Well, I mean, I've trained many more people than uh, I've coached more than one person. And most of our coaches have trained uh, more than one person. But the idea is that since we're volunteer, I mean, people, we've had about 500 people get employment because of this training as well. So there are people that are trained. I mean, because our, our, our training also um, is approved through the cert certification board for PRSS. So some, which is peer recovery support specialist. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So like they can take our training in that, that the, the education counts towards that certificate, that certification. Um, and then we have, and then there are, there's, it's just a variety of different ways that this can be applied within different, you know, careers, if you will. So is your standard coach E, which is a term I've never heard before, <laughs> yes. um, is the, the standard coach E somebody who is already recovered from clean and sober and are hoping to stay that way or are they folks who are trying to get to be clean and sober so our standard coachy is all over the board uh, but most of the time when people because you know we have the life coach component too so let's take that out for a moment if it's somebody that's uh, uh, working through addiction it's typically somebody who is ready but are not solid in their recovery yet so they're 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 start they're trying to continue the process that they've already started, if you will. So how does how do you, the coaching services interact or vary from a sponsor at AA or uh, the the narcotic version of AA? Can I kind of ask yes, that? absolutely. Yeah, so, as Marty said, a, a peer recovery support specialist has to be someone who has um, experience in recovery. So, for example, I could not be a PRSS because I'm not in recovery from a substance use disorder. So when you have a PRSS, you can talk about your experience. You can talk about um, what happened um, as a sponsor. You're, again, you're talking about similarities. You're talking about your meetings. As a coach, I don't do those things. I don't talk about – it's not about me. It's all about the coachee. So if a coachee says, hey, you know um, – what was it like for you when you went through X, Y, and Z? My response is going to be, I appreciate you you know, wanting to know more about me, but I'm here to serve you right now, and this is really about you. And I'm going to redirect them back to the conversation. So as a coach, it, it really is a serving role. It's not anything about me sharing my life. It's not about me sharing my experiences. It's all about having them focus on what they want to achieve in their time frame, right? So when they set a goal, it's all about them and what they want to achieve. And this well, is your all life experience. What made you decide you wanted to become a coach? You know, I, I see a need in this community and in my family for um, people that just need help. They want someone to be able to listen to them and not tell them what to do all the time. They want someone who's going to support them and empower them in their decision making. Um, and so as a coach, I have found that that is one of the most important things that people appreciate about coaching is that there's someone who's going to listen, who's not going to judge what they're doing, and they're going to support them. Um, and also, because we have a network that is full of volunteers, they don't have to worry about the cost of it. You know, the average person, if you go to a life coach, it can be anywhere from 50 to $200 an hour for a coach. When you're coming out of a situation, out of substance use, when you're coming out of a divorce, when you're coming out of an abusive relationship, you just don't have those funds. And so our network is able to provide a service to people that is really needed for, especially those that are marginalized. And did I hear you say this is all done remotely, virtually? It is now, yeah. Okay. Now, now coaches can meet with each other, but a lot of times, you know, when, when we say we're looking we're looking for a coach, uh, people will volunteer. They live across the state. So. But but this assumes a certain socioeconomic status for the the coaches, access to a computer and and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Is, we can use your phone as well. Okay. So. And then how. Um, how, when somebody goes to a psychologist and it's they meet monthly or weekly, de depending. So, how often are the coaches meeting with their clients or their coaches? 
on so, average? Is it a one-off or is it every week? Yeah, so typically that's really, that, that, that we have a working agreement between the coach and the coachee, and that's up to them to decide. Like for me, I give one hour one week if I'm coaching someone. I have so a what, very good friend who does this, Marty and Nicole, and she's licensed and trained in a variety of different aspects of, of the things you're talking about and such. And she's, if she could work 25 hours a day, she'd be full seven days a week and never have an opening. Was there always this need or is this something more recent? Has life gotten to the point where so many more people need these kinds of services? Well, I mean, I would say since I've been involved in recovery, the recovery portion of what's going on in the state, I would say there's always been a need, but it's just now that we have the resources available. Um, you know, I, I, I was looking up, you know, in, in 2019, West Virginia, according to the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy, you know, we had $11.3 billion loss because of, because of uh, addiction and, and in our state. And so I, I don't know what the numbers are for this year, but mm -hmm. how are we as a state uh, going to thrive if we really don't uh, address our addiction issue we have? And, and it's so pervasive. I mean, I don't know, maybe you all are lucky, but I don't know anybody who is not directly impacted that doesn't know someone that they care about or that they're related to that's not dealing with addiction of some form. A quick question, clarification. Yeah, sure. uh, Nicole mentioned uh, divorce, abusive relationship. You're talking about drug and recovery from drugs. Uh, you, you deal with both communities. What's the prevalent, which group do you, community do you do most of your work with? Uh, that's a good question. I would say, you know, it's probably about half and half. Okay. Um, that surprises me. I would have thought it had been much more toward drugs than it would be the, the other side. But. In your experience with the folks who are recovering from an addiction, what, what's the common denominator on what drove them to turn to the addictive uh, substance. substance? Trauma. Yeah. Some okay, trauma, trauma means a lot of things. What right, with some sort of trauma. Traumatic experience, traumatic event. Physical trauma, typically, or emotional trauma? It yes, could be it, could be, it could be both or childhood. Or the and the thought at the time was, it, from their point of view, I'm not casting judgment here, just we're running low on time. If the, the thought process is, I hurt, so therefore, if I turn to this substance, I will feel better? That, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. There was on 60 Minutes last night, I'm not sure if either of you, the two of you saw that, they were highlighting the work of uh, Dr. Ali Razai in Morgantown, and he is now doing work that he used to do with uh, people who had Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and now taking it with addiction and rewiring the circuitry in the brain because if you are addicted, your brain has been rewired. So for the longest time, we thought, you're just weak. You can't put that drug or that drink down. That's right fact of the matter is their brain has been rewired to the point where all the brain does is crave this one feeling mm -hmm. this one thing that can give them that feeling and he's doing work to try to rewire the brain so that that craving is gone yes. and this is breakthrough work here done being done leading the world right here in morgantown west virginia D does the physical aspect of seeing a doctor to do something like that to actually come into any of your discussions uh well as, as coaches, we believe that uh, whatever the coach he chooses as their path to recovery is going to be the right choice. Okay, so we're going to, be, we're going to support that. Now, it may not work for them or it may, uh, but when they choose a pathway, uh, we're going to be totally supportive, and I think that work he's doing is fantastic. Let's, uh, if you could, wrap this up and let uh, our audience know how they can get in touch with you if they'd like to volunteer and, and learn more about being a licensed coach or if they're going through substance abuse right now or any other type of trauma and they need your services, how can they reach you? Again, uh, visit our website at www.strengthingrace.com. Nicole, thanks for coming in. Thanks so much for having us. I appreciate it. Marty, please say hello to John for us. I will do that. And one of our listeners saw you and said, hey, there's my deacon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We all wear different hats. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah.